we felt that it was the stain to the Union that men should be bought and sold like cattle. And that's from his personal memoirs. So That's what uh, he said to, to Bismarck. He said, uh, you know, we felt that it was a stain on the Union that men should be traded, bought and sold like cattle. And Bismarck was like, well, yeah, but, 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 but you had to keep the Union together, right? You had to keep the Union together, right? Uh, and Grant's like, well, you know, s s slavery had to be abolished. Well, the yeah, Union, no, no, slavery. Oh. Now, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we return to the American military history and the evolution of Western warfare. We ended our excerpt from this before because from here on out it's the war and we had to investigate more about the war and its roots but now let's talk about the war and its deadliness now to revisit the theme in the book that we've been in up to this point this this book here the theme so far is that victory in the war against Mexico led to a crisis what to do with the newly won lands are they going to be slave lands or free lands so in the view of this book the Mexican War precipitated the crisis that turned into the Civil War. It's a dress rehearsal and the cause. Uh, so we are on uh, page 92, quote, The Mexican War is often considered a, quote, dress rehearsal for the Civil War. It certainly gave many future Civil War commanders experience, but it was really more like a well-fought war of 1812. The armies were still quite limited in size. Scott's entire army, by Civil War standards, would scarcely have made a respectable army corps. Both sides used predominantly smooth-bore muskets and cannon with ranges and performance little different from those of the 18th century. The objectives of the Mexican War and the Civil War were also quite dissimilar. While the Civil War was, in most respects, a total war, fought for sheer national survival, the Mexican War was essentially a limited war, fought on a manner not terribly different from the dynastic wars of 18th century Europe. So it was kind of like the only war we really knew how to try to fight. Limited in geographic setting, limited in allocation of resources, limited in immediate domestic impact, and on the enemy's own political and social systems, it bore little resemblance to the cataclysm, cataclysm whose origins it inadvertently sowed. It talks about some new technologies. It says, uh, Steam was coming into use in the Navy. <clears throat> this is a very good book. Worth a read, because when they're talking about the technology in the Army, there's not much political nonsense they can stick in there, you know? So it talks about uh, in the steam was coming into use, and they steam was still unreliable, so you had to have masts and sails, plus a big steam engine, so it reduced the amount of guns you could carry. So boats with steam engines although they could go faster and wind didn't affect them and stuff they broke down, they were heavier, they didn't have as many guns on them and instead it was very difficult to design a good ship at the time so that, I just stick that in there to recommend the book to you as one of the little details that you get if you read the whole thing so here's some some considerations, some technological consideration uh, that tells you about the deadliness of the Civil War compared to any given you know, decade in the past, the decades of the 50s, 60s, were, were prime for deadliness. Quote, with a smooth bore musket, one could simply pour some powder down the barrel and then drop in the bullet, a process that took very little time. With a rifled musket, however, one had to pound the bullet down the barrel with a mallet and long rod. All that pounding took time. Now, one of the reasons for this is a smooth bore musket uh, the bullet doesn't have to be exactly the same size as the thing. It doesn't have to, to catch on the riflings and spin it. But with a, a, a rifle, it does have to catch on the riflings or it's not effective. So you have to have a bullet the right size after you're big enough. All that pounding took time. Meanwhile, an enemy armed with smoothbore musket could hurry forward and shoot first because you just drop the ball in with some powder and bang. That was why armies in the 18th and early 19th century mainly used smooth boards. Only special troops used rifles. In the 1840s, however, a French army captain, Claude E. Minet, invented a way to load a rifled musket as easily as a smooth bore. Called the Minet ball, 
It was a cylindro-conoidal ball that could be dropped right down the barrel. One end of it was hollow. So I don't know what cylindro-conoidal means, but it's a bullet with one end that's hollowed out so that when there's an explosion at this end with the powder, this goes and and that outer edge catches the riflings and helps it to spin. Uh, so you don't have to pound the ball down in there. You don't have to have it the same size as the damn thing to be effective. Continuing the quote, when the rifle was fired, the expanding gas made the gunpowder widen uh, the sides of this hollow end, uh, and the sides of the hollow end gripped the rifling, creating the spinning effect required for good accuracy. Instead of hitting a target at a maximum of 100 yards, a good marksman could hit a target with a rifled musket at four times that range or better. Spurred by the energetic Jefferson Davis, who served as Secretary of War in the mid-1850s, the Army quickly adopted the ruffled, rifled musket. 1850s, so it doesn't even know how to use it in battle. Nobody knows how to use it in battle. Nobody on the planet uh, has an army totally equipped with rifled muskets. No wars have been fought with this. Tactics haven't adopted to it and so on, so let's go with this here. The Army also pondered how to modify its infantry tactics to adapt to this innovation. The fruit of these ruminations, however, amounted to little more than an increase in the regulation marching pace of soldiers on the attack. In other words, you got to get forward quicker because uh, they can start hitting you sooner. They must reach the enemy lines more rapidly, it was understood, to compensate for the increased range and accuracy of the rifled musket. No one yet guessed when thousands of mini balls, deadly at ranges of 400 yards and beyond, could really do to troops advancing shoulder to shoulder in the old Napoleon style. What could it do? Well, we learned in the Civil War, didn't we? As is usual, and quite understandable, in such situations, military men expected that this new development would simply modify the existing tactical environment, not overthrow it. So this military historian asserts that uh, they couldn't really have seen all that f uh, coming, could they? They really couldn't have, he says. Strauss. Richard Strauss, Sonatinen, number one, aus der Werkstatt, eines Invaliden, and number two, Frohliche Werkstatt, the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Now then, as we were on Chapter 4, the Civil War, um, at 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, a dull boom thudded across the tranquil harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. Poetic opening to the Civil War. <clears throat> the deadliest conflict in American history, and in many respects the central episode of that history, had begun. No one had any idea what to expect, says this author. Now, did they at the time have some idea what to expect? Perhaps Beethoven would be a more appropriate track during such an ominous lesson, but let us continue. Most Americans supposed that war would be decided by one or two major battles. A few, ye a few even believed that it might end without any serious fighting at all. But nearly everyone agreed that at most the struggle would be settled within a year. That was just unanimous opinion. There were probably a few far-sighted people who said this is going to be very, very, very bad, like Adams, uh, half a century earlier. Uh, white Southerners expected to maintain an agrarian, slave-holding society that, in their minds at least, corresponded to the republic established by the Founding Fathers. Northerners sought to restore the unbroken alliance of states toasted by President Andrew Jackson nearly three decades before. Quote, Our federal union, it must be preserved. But instead of a brief contest, the Civil War raged across the central and southern United States for four long years. And instead of conserving, conserving the old America, however defined, it steadily and profoundly reshaped the political, economic, and social contours of the nation. By the time the war ended, the original American Republic was gone forever. The Civil War was, as one historian aptly called it, the Second American Revolution. And good one both times. Like the war for independence, it was a revolutionary conflict combining the mass politics and 